about gravitational wave signatures for massive cage persons produced during inflation. Um, this work is uh, has been done in collaboration with uh, people from Florida, so Professor Weishue and fellow graduate students, Shuse New and Katki Srinivasan. And we're hoping to have the paper in archive in a couple of weeks. So let's get started. Let me first give a outline of what I'm going to talk about. So uh, first I'll talk about the possibility of detecting massive cage bosons produced during inflation. And I will briefly over, give an overview of how it has been proposed uh, to be done and what is the new thing that I want to propose that how it can be done. Then I will give a, an example of a massive cage boson model, a simple model, which basically is, uh, gives us a coupling between the inflaton and the gauge fields through this John Simmons kind of coupling, where the phi is the inflaton and F and F tilde are gauge boson strings. So this term would be the only source of uh, the way that inflaton can talk to the gauge bosons and the way gauge bosons can be produced from the decay of the inflaton during inflation. And I will show that this leads to a exponential enhancement of particle production uh, and it will lead to observable signatures later on. Then I will give the most up-to-date constraint on this model from CMB physics. I'll look at the specific observables from CMB compare them with the predictions from this model. And I'll show that the parameter space of the model is pretty restricted from the uh, CMB physics. And finally, I'll show that uh, we can use gravitational waves as a discovery signal for looking at the presence of these particles during inflation. And I'll show that we will have a gravitational wave signal that covers a very broad range of frequency spectrum. So it can be probed in many different interferometers, both at the terrestrial level and at the space level. So before I get into the main story, let me tell you the gist of it in a couple of minutes, maybe, uh, in the hope that uh, you would probably be interested to listen to one hour boring talk after that. So the main problem that I want to address today is is it possible for us to detect the presence of massive gauge bosons during inflation? And by massive, I mean mass of the order of Hubble scale during inflation. Now, this problem has been looked at before. Uh, people typically look at the three point correlation function of the scalar perturbations. So, to give an example, I drew some funny pictures here. So, let's say the inflaton has some perturbations, which I denote by this delta phi. And I want to look at a configuration where I have a three different sources to look at these perturbations. And I can draw a Feynman diagram like this, where in the blob, you have all sorts of uh, extra particles that you're thinking, which might be present during uh, inflation. So for in the context of today's talk, this blob would contain loops from the gauge bosons. So we look at this three point correlation function and we choose a very particular uh, configuration where two of the momenta this K1, K2, and K3 are external momenta. So two of the momenta are almost same, but they are much larger than the third one. So this setup is called a squeezed limit. And if we look at the three-point correlation function as a function of the momentum ratios in this squeezed limit, then we see an oscillatory pattern. And interestingly, the period of the oscillation is related to the mass. So basically we want to look at this oscillatory pattern and then calculate the frequency of this signal. And that should tell us the information about mass. So this is the way of discovering new particles present during inflation. This has been around since 2009 by different groups of people, but this whole idea was popularized by Nimar Kanihame then Juan Maldasena in a seminal paper in 2015. And they coined the term cosmological collider. So why is it called cosmological collider? Because in a typical terrestrial collider like LHC, you basically want to have uh, something like a collision or some process that generates particles. And then you have calorimeters or stuff that can basically detect the presence of these particles. So in analogy with that, the early universe could be a very high energy particle collider because uh, I mean, uh, it's a very high energy medium. And then if you have particles produced there, and if that gives you observable signatures of those particles, then basically you can see the presence of those massive particles present in the early universe in high energy. So following the analogy, uh, Nima and Malasena, they coined the term cosmological collider. Now, 
what I want to propose today is an alternative way of looking at cosmological collider signals by using the gravitational wave interferometers as particle detectors. So how is that possible? Because we have very strong gravitational wave signals um, coming from the presence of those extra particles. And interestingly, these gravitational wave signals are not peaked at any particular frequency. You have a very wide brand of signals. So they should be uh, detectable in many different colliders operating at different frequencies. I will get into the details of what kind of colliders can see these signals and what the sensitivities are later on. And the main results of the paper are first, we take a very simple model where the gauge bosons can talk to the inflaton and we keep the most up-to-date constraint from CMB physics on this model. And secondly, we uh, calculate the characteristic gravitational wave signal that we can have from there and compare with the sensitivity of pulsar timing areas, LISAs and LIGOs, basically detectors at all possible frequencies that we have right now. To give a snapshot, uh, this would be the model that I would be looking at. The gauge uh, fields have the typical FF term and the mass term. And then this is the extra term, phi FF tilde, that we want to introduce so that they can talk to the um, inflatons. And for a benchmark point, these are the different detectors we have here. These uh, colored lines are sensitivities of different detectors. And this red line is what CMB can probe. And I will show that we will have a signal here like this. We will just evade the constraint from CMB, but have a signal that rises later on to be sensitive to the pulsar timing areas, to LISA and to LIGO and other, other uh, interferometers. So this is the gist of the story. I gave you the result. Uh, now let's get into the more details. Okay, so we are interested in the inflationary universe. Uh, typically the common law is after Big Bang, uh, we had a period of accelerated expansion. Uh, and in that period, basically uh, that's responsible for creating the, what we currently see is a macroscopic homogeneity and isotropy in the universe. So inflation is a very successful theory. So far, probably the most successful theory for explaining these things. And it solves many puzzles uh, that arise otherwise, like horizon problem, flatness problem, et cetera. I will not get into the details. Uh, now, what happens during inflation is that uh, in particle physics lingo, we say that there is a scalar field or a CO2 scalar field called inflaton. And it slowly rolls down its potential initially. And at the end of inflation or close to the end of inflation, by the time it reaches almost the minima, then it starts to vigorously oscillate with respect to the minima. And in the process, it creates tiny perturbations. These perturbations are um, quantum mechanical in nature, but because of the expansion of the space time, um, these perturbations should be stretched out uh, to the point that they leave the horizon and they freeze in, there is no change after that. But eventually at later stages, it can re-enter the horizon during reheating period, and it can lead to the basically uh, structure formation or the largest class structures that you see today. Mm -hmm. So these inflationary perturbations are very important because that's how we have uh, largest class structures now. And in the absence of anything else, just the inflaton, we know that these perturbations are completely Gaussian, at least that's what the observations tell us. However, if you have extra stuff present during inflation, other than the inflaton, for example, massive gauge bosons, then this extra stuff can interfere with these perturbations and potentially make them non-Gaussian. Now that would be one of the things that people look at uh, to detect the presence of extra particles in the context of cosmological collider. Um, we also have some constraints on these perturbations. So typically we can calculate the two point correlation function for these uh, perturbations, which gives tells us uh, how much power we have in the scalar perturbations and in the tensor perturbations. And at CMB, we can actually observe uh, the scalar power spectrum. It's quite well measured now. The current estimate is roughly 10 to the power minus nine. And then as I mentioned that if there are extra stuff present during inflation, which we do not know, but an indirect way could be to look at uh, if there is any non-Gaussianity present, that would be an indirect mark of extra stuff being present. And non-Gaussianity is typically measured by a parameter called FNL. There are uh, currently quite strict bounds on FNL from CMB physics, and it would get better in the coming CMB experiments. So that's another probe that we can uh, constrain uh, models using. 
And finally, we do not know how to exactly calculate uh, tensor power, but we can calculate the ratio of tensor to scalar power, which is given by this parameter R, tensor to scalar ratio. And this is quite well constrained now, and it will continue to be constrained in the coming decades. So these are the three main observables that I will be concerned in this talk. There are, of course, other observables people look at, but for simplicity, I will only concentrate on these three things. Okay, uh, now. Uh, Rahat? Yeah. Um, I have some extreme elementary questions. Mm -hmm, uh, sure. So um, uh, the things that you're observing, the scalar power spectrum or the non gaussianity or the tensor to scalar ratio, uh, right. so, um, how are these related to the correlation functions of the inferton fields? Um, the scalar power spectrum is basically two point correlation proportional to the two point correlation function of the uh, inferton field. Well, okay. not exactly the inferton field. We have to make it a gauge invariant quantity, but that's proportional to the inferton perturbation. And the tensor perturbation comes because of uh, the because of the um, um, inferton perturbation. We will have some perturbation in the metric tensor. Mm -hmm. And we can calculate the two point correlation function for that perturbation, and that would be proportional to the tensor power. Uh, I see. Okay. And the uh, inferton field is charged under which gauge group? It is not charged under the standard model gauge groups. Uh, if we uh, think of a BSM theory, then it's up to us to do. So far, I think on the only thing we can think of is the inferton possibly has a shift symmetry. It's pro okay. probably an axion like particle, but that's also a model dependent statement. It could be that the inflaton has no charge under any of these, but we have a, like you can think of multi field inflation or that kind of thing. So you have at least two scalars, one of them has shift symmetry, the other doesn't, et cetera. I see. And in practice, what are we observing um, that uh, tells us uh, these values of the power spectrum or uh, the, the other two quantities? I mean, is it related to CMB or yeah, something else? It's related to CMB. So in CMB, what you see is uh, temperature fluctuations. So mm -hmm. what we have is a heat map and we can see temperature fluctuations. And okay. temperature fluctuation consists of both the scalar perturbations and tensor perturbations. But there are techniques using which you can separate out the scalar part and the tensor part. So you look at, I, see. I mean, in reality, you look at temperature perturbation, but then uh -huh. you can extract the information about the scalar perturbation from there. And then you can extract the information about the ratio of tensor to scalar. From there, okay. you can indirectly determine tensor power. I see. Uh, but uh, so the observations that are being made in CMB, I mean, they're observing some kind of photons, right? Because it's electromagnetic waves. Uh, yeah, these are CMB so, uh, scale photons, right? Uh, exactly. Um, and they're affected by the inference by some kind of couplings. Uh, yes, they are. They are. Oh, okay, you are asking whether the photon is coupled to the inflaton in some way. Right. I mean, so how is the inferton affecting these quantities? Uh, that's a good question. I, I I'm not I'm not really an expert on this, but I my guess is that the inferton, if it has has shift symmetry, then it can mm -hmm. couple to the standard model photons through this term again. Okay. 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 Here I am not thinking that this is a standard model field. I'm right. thinking of a possibly BSM field, which is massive. Okay. But. Yes, it can couple. Okay, things. but we know how to observe the CMB uh, spectrum and from there determine, determine what the correlation functions of the inflaton fields are. Right, right. We know that. Okay, okay. all right. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, very nice question. So, uh, since you are considering accelerated expansion, that means the universe is not yet flat. Am I right? Uh, universe is not flat, so we can think of a, but we can think of an uh, FRW metric in a space. Okay, space. so it's robertson walker metric, that means, right. so then what's the state you are considering? Because in robertson walker metric, you don't have a vacuum state, so, they, but they have other states. So what, what state are you considering for your correlation function? Oh, for the correlation functions are basically only for the perturbation. So you have a vacuum part and then you have perturbations with respect to it. And we can only observe the perturbation. We cannot really observe the vacuum part. So you are assuming there exists some state on Robertson Walker space time. And that is space, that is state can be written as a, a perturbative expansion of Minkowski vacuum. And you are observing or computing 
uh, with respect to that part or bedding part. Am I right? Is that the physical picture? Naively? Uh, I, I, I'm not quite sure really. I didn't think about this. So you're saying that you are expanding with respect to the Minkowski. I, have I mean, so what's the that. state? I mean, what's this? So you are going to talk about correlation function. So to right. get a correlation function, you've showed us your observables, like the infrared mm -hmm. fields, coupled mm -hmm. with some other photons, not a standard model photon, okay? And now you need a state, with, right? So uh, that was I was thinking, which state are you considering? It's not the Minkowski vacuum because you are in Robertson Walker. No, it's not the Minkowski vacuum for sure. Um, well, what I'm thinking is that, so let's say inflaton is just a scalar or a pseudo scalar. Mm -hmm, okay. uh, this is present in an FRW metric. Mm -hmm. And the inflaton has some quantum mechanical fluctuations. Now in an FRW metric, we have a period where we have the scale factor is expanding, the universe is expanding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, it is a stretching out the perturbations. Yes. And by the time we actually are able to see these is at CMB scale. So by the time this, because of being stretched, they actually leave the horizon and they're in the, eventually they will re-enter the horizon. And only by the time they come to the fre CMB frequencies, then we will see the observable effects. So throughout, I'm assuming that there is an FRW metric and uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not. I, I'm not sure if I'm getting the question. Uh, okay, maybe we can talk later. Uh, okay, thank you. Sure. Yeah, please carry on. Okay, so now let's take a look at uh, the particle production mechanism. So in general, if we try to produce massive particles during inflation, uh, the main problem we encounter is that there would be a Boltzmann-like suppression. The production of any massive particle would be suppressed by exponentially by mass over Hubble ratio. Now, if we have massless particles or if the mass is much smaller compared to Hubble, that's not a problem. We can produce those particles uh, efficiently. But uh, in this talk, I would be mostly concerned about particles which are at least uh, of the scale of Hubble or even larger, primarily because I want to propose an alternative way of looking at cosmological collider physics. And in cosmological collider physics, you have that oscillatory signal only if your mass is comparable to the Hubble scale or larger. So now that is, a, of course, a problem for us because then how are we going to oh, beat this yeah. factor? So can, can, uh, can, you, can you give me the, um, uh, the, the range of, of this mass, like, like it's up to which scale? Like, uh, like, uh, like what the Hubble, Hubble, Hubble is? Hubble is supposed, right, no, no, like so, you, you, uh, when you call, you know, in, in mass term, what is the, what is the upper limit or what is the lower limit? I mean, like, what is it in the range of GV, TV, or more, more massive than? Okay, uh, thank you. It's actually. Um, Can you give me a number. Like, like... Yeah. So for Hubble scale, there are different ways to. We don't exactly know what the Hubble scale was at the end of inflation, but if we have some estimates from Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Uh, roughly of the order of 10 to the power 14 GeV. So I'm talking about very, very massive states, uh, 10 to the power 11, 12, 13, 14 GeV thing like that. Okay, so why, why, would, why would we want to consider such heavy particles? Uh, primarily in this talk, primarily because I want to propose a complementary way of looking at gravitation uh, at uh, cosmological collider signals, that oscillatory signal. And you have oscillatory signals only if, uh, if your produced particles are of the Hubble scale. If they are much smaller than the Hubble scale, then you do not have any detectable oscillation. Okay. And then okay. you can ask, like, why do we think about such massive particles? Does it make mm -hmm. sense even, or why are they interesting? Mm -hmm. So they are interesting because in many theories of grand unification, we have very, very heavy states, uh, both the scalars and uh, gauge bosons and fermions. Uh, for example, if you have a, a SOTAN kind of unification, then you can have gauge bosons related to that, which are supposed to be very, very heavy, uh, typically 10 to the power 12 GeV or higher. So it's not an unnatural scale. It's natural scale for that kind of physics. Okay. Um, so as I was mentioning that it's 
where uh, it's a uh, naively difficult to produce this kind of heavy particles, but um, I will show that there is a way to overcome this. So if we have massive particles that couple to the inflaton, then what happens is that then you can basically produce these massive particles from inflaton, but they can also inverse decay into the inflaton. And if they inverse decay into the inflaton, then it will modify the perturbations generated by the inflaton. So in the absence of any other extra particles, the inflaton has some sort of perturbation. But because now we have a way of inverse decaying into inflaton from these gauge bosons or other stuff, then it would inevitably impact these curvature perturbations. And as I mentioned, that it can potentially make it non-Gaussian. Now, as Navafis is asking, what exactly we measure is uh, that we, delta phi is the inflaton's perturbation, but it is not a gauge invariant quantity. So to make it gauge invariant, we introduce a new um, quantity, which is called the co-moving curvature perturbation that basically multiplies the inflaton's perturbation with h over phi dot. Phi dot is the inflaton's rolling speed, h is the Hubble scale. And in cosmological collider physics, people used to look at the three-point correlation function for this in a particular configuration called the squeeze limit, which is basically one of the external momenta is much smaller than the other two external momenta. But yeah. Yeah. So what are the, uh, these external momenta are for uh, your inceton fields? I mean, like, uh, they are the incoming uh, incetons, right? Yeah, you can think of them as inflaton perturbations, not exactly inflaton perturbations as, I, as I'm showing here, it's proportional to that. Um, but roughly so the I'm physics like, wise, you can think of that. Way. Right. Like for the three point function, the, the, the incoming states are the incetton fields, right? And, uh, and the gauge boson that's inter interacting, is, it, it is in the loop, right? I mean, so it no free loop. dynamics of the gauge, gauge fields. It is just no, interacting right. through the incetton fields. Okay. Right, right. Yes, we want to basically look at how are the dynamics of the inflaton field being modified by the presence of this right. gauge fields in the loop. So it will modify the perturbations. And if we look at a very particular configuration where two of the external momenta is much larger than the third, then we find that this three-point correlation function has an oscillatory shape. If we plot it with respect to the ratio of the momentum scales. And the frequency of this oscillation here is proportional to the mass. So you look at this configuration, you find out the frequency, and that tells you what the mass of the particle would be. This is the mechanism that uh, other people have proposed, and specifically uh, Maldasena and Nima have made it very popular in 2015. So this is the way of looking at the presence of massive particles during inflation. Sorry, I have a Again, naive question. So mm -hmm. this is curvature perturbation, the uh, right. zeta. So it's cu uh, curvature of what? Is it like curvature of space time? Yeah, in a sense, because uh, Hubble rate and phi dot, these are, these are representative of what's going on in the space time. But uh, so it's basically then uh, some perturbation of Ricci scalar of uh, Robertson Walker space time, right? Uh, actually, this is just the inflaton's perturbation. And you can think of this h over phi dot just as a multiplicative factor to that to make it gauge invariant. But essentially, physics wise, this is just the perturbation of the inflaton. But then, I, how perturbation of inflation is related to the curvature of space time? Oh, why do we call it curvature perturbation? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, that curvature? could be a misnomer. I think it's because of the presence of h over phi dot here. Because ah, so h it has. Phi dot yeah, please carry on. Yeah, I, I think H and phi dot contains information about what's going on in the space time, but um, I mean, I, I don't think okay, this is so just it's, a part it's of not directly with the Ricci scalar or something. It's not directly. I don't think so. Okay, yeah. no, thank I don't you. Think so. Thank you. Um, okay, so this is the way of looking at the presence of new particles by looking at the uh, scalar perturbations. Now, what I want to look at is the other thing, the shift the focus to tensor perturbations. So these tensor perturbations are basically perturbations of the space-time metric. And they, again, same way, they get stretched and they leave the horizon, they re-enter the horizon. Now, for scalar perturbations, when they re-enter the horizon, they eventually lead to larger scalar structures, as you see today. But these tensor perturbations upon re-entry, they will source gravitational waves. <laughs> 
Now we have some constraints on these gravitational waves uh, at the CMB scale from the tensor to scalar ratio, as I mentioned you before. So the current estimate from tens of tensor to scalar ratio from Planck 2018 data is very restrictive. It tells you that the ratio of the tensor power to scalar power has to be at least two orders of magnitude smaller. Now we have very good estimate of the scalar power. So from this bound, we can basically translate this into an upper bound on the tensor power or equivalently an upper bound on the gravitational wave amplitude. And that turns out to be quite weak. It's of the order of 10 to the power minus 16. Now, let me uh, get back to the picture before to uh, basically show you why I think this is so small. So 10 to the power minus 16 would be a signal here. And as you can see, uh, except DESIGO and BBO, which are planned experiments supposed to be operational in mid 2040s, none of the other currently operating or going to be started soon experiments would be sensitive to that signal. So there is no way we can see that kind of signal at least until DESIGO and BBO starts operating by mid 2040s. Now, what happens is, is there a way that we can, the signal is low at the CMB scales, that's okay. We just avoid the upper bound from CMB. But is it possible that later on, this signal would start to increase and be sensitive to the interferometers? And I'll show that, yes, it is possible. Now in naively, uh, forget about this particular talk, naively, is it possible to have that kind of signal if you have extra scalars present? It's not possible, people have shown that. What about extra fermions? Like we could have very massive fermions like right-handed neutrinos or that kind of things. But fermions do not lead to enhanced signal. However, vector bosons can. So we would be using this as a way to probe vector bosons. So, sorry, again, a knife question. So is there any simple way to understand why fermion will not contribute because they don't enhance it or is it just uh, computation? Um, I think there is a naive way to look at it. It's mostly because of the coupling here. So be because of this coupling, I'll show that when you look at the equation of motion of the gauge fields, they will depend on the time derivative of the inflaton. And the time, so time derivative of the inflaton is uh, in a sense related to slow rolling of the inflaton. During inflation, the inflaton kind of moves slowly until it reaches the end of inflation then its velocity increases and kind of becomes order one. The uh, slower parameter becomes order one. So because the gauge field's production is exponentially, I'll show that it's exponentially dependent on this velocity. The velocity is kind of small during the early stages of inflation, but as the inflation progresses, this uh, keeps going up and the gauge field's, uh, gauge field's production is exponentially dependent on that. So basically it's exponentially enhanced. That doesn't happen for fermions. If you want to write the like the smallest uh, uh, order quantity term for fermions coupling to this, I think you have to write a dimension six term. Uh, you can probably write something like del mu phi with psi gamma mu psi. So, sorry, that's uh, yeah. dimension five. Yeah, so that does not depend on phi dot. Okay, so you need something as a time derivative of phi. Otherwise, exactly. it will not contribute. Okay, thank you. Otherwise, no. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think yeah. I don't understand the um, when you you know in the, in the previous slide uh, when you said that um, um, you know like the the, um, the the gravitational wave amplitude at CMB scale. I'm like, uh, can you please explain that? Uh, how we we are expecting gravitational wave signal at CMB scale? I'm like what uh, I'm like I'm like what are the sources of this sort of gravitational wave? I mean like um, why should we uh, you know like I'm mean, like what possible um, sources can uh, be induced? Can you please explain on that? Um, okay, so these gravitational waves come from tensor perturbations. They are basically I'm not sure if I can write here. Let's try. Yeah, there is a whiteboard if you want to write. Uh, uh, can you remind me how I switched to that? 
so if you go there, there is an option in whiteboard, like uh, like share screen, live oh. transcript, breakout room, reactions, and there is a whiteboard. And then if you use your mouse, I mean, not a very nice way, but can. Uh, and uh, also there is something up uh, with your uh, Zoom where you can also write in front, uh, up top up of your PDF. Yeah, maybe I can try that. Yeah, Let's yeah, try that. sure. Okay. Go on. So your yeah perfect your space time metric is basically you have um, i'm just writing the ij part so you mm -hmm. have the delta ij part and sorry you have this part revisions for your spatial components so this is what you'd have in a in a Robertson Walker metric. We don't really distinguish between the x square, y square, and z square, right? Because you have, uh, in a sense, it's isotropic. But you could, because of the presence of this, uh, I mean, in, in general, not not just the, because of the presence of anything, uh, in during inflationary perturbations, you have these extra components. These are we call them tensor perturbations because they have two indices. So these okay. tensor perturbations, they are just uh, quantum mechanical perturbations, but because of the expansion of the space time, they leave the horizon, but when they re-enter, they source gravitational waves. Now horizon re-entry happens actually much earlier than CMB. CMB skills are even later. So you have gravitational waves even before CMB, but our observational probes are only start, they start from CMB. So at the CMB scale, you would see gravitational wave signals, which we have not seen, but we have an upper limit. Jawad, am I answering yeah. your question? Um, well, no, I, I didn't quite get you, but uh, I think you carry on, you know, I, you know like, let me think on that. Okay, maybe we can talk yeah, after sure. after the talk. Yeah, I mean, I probably have to show a bit more math, but okay. So, oh, another thing is that I'm like, how come I'm like du during that inflation era? I'm like, how come you are considering, you know, like um, the uh, you know like Robertson Walker type space time? I mean, like you know, like um, at that at that uh, you know like at that moment, why it is uh, you know uh, why why I should consider that um, uh, the metric should be like, I mean, there should be a validity of this Robertson Walker type metric. Right? Uh, Robertson Walker metric basically tells you that it's a homogeneous and isotropic universe. And uh, we but don't really have any. Right, but there's a fi you know, fixed time direction, right? There is, there is a, you know, like, um, like specified. No, I, I think right? Robertson Walker metric, yeah, you, uh, the, it, it, you know, there is a, the the form of the Robertson Walker, Walker metric is general enough that for a certain choice of the scale factor, it is de Sitter space. So inflation can be described. Uh, it's quite standard. It can be explained in terms of Robertson Walker metric, but you have to choose the right scale factor. Yeah, sorry, yeah because essentially you wanted to de Sitter. No. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry for answering the question for on no, the no, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. uh, may, may I have a comment regarding this issue? Yeah, sure. So as uh, Tibros commented, I just would like to compliment that if you uh, uh, demand you have homogeneity and uh, certain symmetry, then there is Birkhoff theorem, which tells that you have only Robertson Walker and then as Tibros mentioned you choose your scaling factor if it's exponential then it's decitter so there is no freedom that you can do anything else provided you assume this symmetry and uh, which has been assumed in this work and we know that this is large scale universe is homogeneous so you don't have any other room otherwise you have to change einstein theory oh, thank you okay um uh, let me stop the annotation. Okay. Okay, so now let's get back to the model I want to talk about. So we have 
this massive cage bosons, uh, we have a mass term and it couples to the inflaton. And I, I should mention that by introducing a mass term explicitly, I, this is no longer gauge invariant. So I want to think of this as a low energy version of the even high energy theory. So the mass could come from some sort of a Stuckelberg mechanism or some sort of weird Higgs mechanism. But um, at a higher scale, I have gauge symmetry. But what I'm writing here is an effective Lagrangian. So what happens here is that- Is this uh, A your, um, this, uh, is this A, is it, this, uh, is it the mass of your gauge boson that you have written the red F nu nu? Uh, the mass of the gauge boson is this term, ma square ma nu. Right. Oh, this, this same A field, is it the same field appearing in the red F nu nu? Uh, yes, the... yes. Okay. Yeah, it is the same field that uh, appears in F nu. Uh, those who are not familiar, F mu nu is basically just uh, derivative of A mu minus the other yes. way. Yeah, so I'm just a field that this A is the photon field of the- Oh no, side. I should clarify. It, it is, is not the photon. photon field. None of these are the standard model photon field. I'm thinking of a some other gauge field, for potentially some BSM field. Oh, I see. But yeah. if you think in terms of the structure of the, like what is F mu nu? Yeah, it's the same kind of, expression as a photon. Photon is just a gauge person, right? But okay. this is not photon, For first of all, because I uh, this is massive. Mm -hmm. And I am specifically, I don't want to look at photon. I want to look at some massive gauge person. Okay. So typically for a, a gauge field, you have four degrees of freedom. But uh, for this case, you get rid of one degree of freedom from the equation of motion. You can impose this condition. Now for the massless case, this kind of conditions come as a gauge choice, but for the massive case, it's not a choice, uh, but we can still derive from the equation of motion, this kind of constant, which leaves us with three degrees of freedom. Now among these three, two why are- Why there is partial mu, I mean, why not covariant derivative? Is it coming from the equation of motion or is it a, by choice? Uh, because I am not thinking of any Higgs present in my theory so far, so I don't have a way to make it covariant. Uh, no, no, because you are considering space-time curvature, so partial derivative doesn't has any meaning. You, you should take Levis Vita covariant derivative, isn't it? Right, right, right. Don't you? No, the square you root is there, so it's a square root inside the derivative, so it's actually covariant derivative. It's quite oh, okay. a standard standard way of expressing the divergence in curved space-time. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you. Oh, oh thank you. Okay, so you are left with uh, two transverse modes and one longitudinal mode. And now if we did not have this term, if we just have the first two terms, even then you can actually produce uh, massive particles uh, by some, I mean, uh, in that case, uh, only the longitudinal mode is produced. It's a completely gravitational production just from the expansion of space time. But this is not the case that is happening here. I just wanted to briefly mention it because I think many people are familiar with the way we can produce uh, longitudinal modes from just from the expansion of the space time. But when this extra term is present, this is called the John Simmons term, sorry. In that case, uh, actually the other thing happens. In this case, one of the transverse modes would be exponentially enhanced. How that happens is if we uh, solve the equation of motion for the gauge field from this Lagrangian, we see that the um, it exponentially depends on this parameter psi, which is nothing but phi dot with respect to lambda n h. So this is in a sense related to the inflaton's velocity. Now, depending on what convention we are using, phi dot could be positive or negative. Let me take it to be positive without loss of generality. Then for phi dot being positive, then this parameter xi would be positive. So I see that the plus mode would be exponentially enhanced, whereas the minus mode would be exponentially suppressed. And then the second part here, this W function is called a Whittaker function. This is an oscillatory complex function. So overall what happens is that the mode function, the plus part is an oscillatory function, but there is an exponential enhancement. So there'll be at least some period where it will be exponentially enhanced and we would have copious particle production in that regime. The other mode function, A minus, would be much suppressed compared to that. So for the rest of my talk, I will only concentrate on the A plus mode, which is exponentially enhanced. I will forget about the longitudinal mode. I'll forget about the A minus mode. Now to give a more uh, physical picture, let's look at the energy density of these modes. 
Uh, here I am showing the x-axis is in terms of conformal time tau, uh, which basically goes from minus infinity to zero. So this uh, picture should be looked at from right to the left. So initially what I have here, this divergent part is contributed from the vacuum modes. By the time we reach uh, k tau to, uh, here, then the slowly the gauge modes will start to take over and we have exponential enhancement and we have copious particle production in this region where k tau is almost order one. And soon after the oscillatory part takes over and uh, it kind of dies out. So we will have a, quite a bit of particle production in this region. Now, there are two free parameters in this model. One is the inflatance velocity or the uh, this uh, parameter called psi, which is for some weird reason called a chemical potential. And the other parameter is of course the mass of the particle. Now, of course I want to look at Hubble scale masses, but let's say there can be order one fluctuations. Like I can, uh, it could be like one Hubble or up to 10 Hubble. There is no physical reason why it has to be there, but I'm specifically interested in this region. So I let it vary there. Now I want to look yeah. at, yeah. I mean, Please. is there any mechanism that, that you're saying that there will be copious particle production? Is there any mechanism that you have uh, described in your paper? Like how yeah. this, yeah, yeah. Can you say that? Yeah, basically from this Lagrangian, you can find out the equation of motion for the gauge modes. So when you do that, we see that, uh, one of the transverse okay. mode here is exponentially enhanced. So how do you calculate the number density of the particles? That would be proportional to the modulus square of this quantity. So your number density would be then exponentially enhanced. Are you asking for like a more physical picture? How? Yeah, I'm like, oh, I'm like, yeah, I'm like, it's a classical solution. I mean, like. Um, so you can think of this term. Okay, so yeah. if you think of a Feynman diagram, basically you have right, the inflaton right. that can that can decay into gauge modes. Okay. Now, whether that would be enhanced or not, that depends on the mode function solution, whether your mode function is uh, large enough or not. But just by the mere presence of this term, you can basically draw a Feynman diagram that tells you that from the inflaton, you could produce gauge modes. <coughs> Okay, now to give an idea about how this uh, particle production depends on these two parameters, I want to show some benchmark points here. So let's say if I compare the red curve with the purple curve, uh, they have the same mass, ma over h is five, but uh, the red curve has larger chemical potential psi. And in that case, it's uh, larger of course, because we expect it because it's exponentially dependent on that. On the other hand, if I compare, um, this uh, purple curve with the blue curve here, they have the same chemical potential, but uh, the blue curve has a smaller mass. We see that the smaller masses are easier to produce. And that also kind of makes sense because we know that any massive particle has a, some sort of Boltzmann-like suppression, exponential minus mass. So if it's less massive, it's easier to produce. So in that case, we have more copious particle production. And on the other hand, if I you know, think of the mass and chemical potential are almost same order, then for this green curve where both the chemical potential and mass are same five, we see that there is no exponential enhancement at all. So we will, the lesson from this picture is that um, we have to concentrate on the parameter space where the chemical potential is larger than the mass. And the more large it is, uh, the more particle production we would have. So therefore the more observable effects we will have. But that in a sense could work as a constraint for us because we have observables of C and B, which are quite constrained. So basically then now, now uh, in order to look at the model, we will use these constraints on uh, from C and B physics as a constraint on these two parameters, mass and chemical potential. Okay. Now to get into a bit more details about the, uh, perturbations. Uh, first, I want to look at the scalar perturbations. So what does the presence of these massive gauge modes have to do with the scalar? Uh, I mean, how do they impact the, the scalar perturbations? So the way to look that is we look at the equation of motion for the inflaton, and we look at the Friedman equation, which gives us the Hubble rate in terms of the inflaton part, perturbations. Now, what we see here is that uh, on the right-hand side of these equations, we have extra terms, 
which would not be present in the absence of the gauge fields, but because of the presence of the gauge fields, we have terms like E dot E or E square plus B square. Here E and B are some electric and magnetic fields related to the gauge mode. Of course, these are not related to the standard model photon or um, corresponding things, but we can define similar things for this uh, gauge boson. So in the presence of the gauge boson would alter the dynamics of the inflaton and it might potentially impact the Hubble rate during inflation. Uh, now, what happens uh, from here is that now it's a bit complicated to calculate these effects, at least initially. So for now, let's say I want to concentrate on the region where the effect of these terms on the right hand side are negligible, at least at the CMB scale. Now, how do they impact things is we can define a source term for this differential equation in terms of E dot B and what we call a curvature, co-moving curvature perturbation, zeta k. So we remember that's h over phi dot times the inflaton's perturbation. And by averaging over the perturbative part, we can, from this first equation of motion, we can see that it can be written in terms of the source term. Here, gk is the Green's function related to this first differential equation for the inflatons. So these are all standard machineries of how you can look at things. Essentially, what you do is you calculate your the source term, how it depends on the presence of this E and B fields. And then you can see what your perturbations are. Once we have the curvature perturbation, then we can go on business with by calculating the two point correlation function or three point correlation function, because our observables like power spectrum is proportional to the two point correlation function. And non gaussianity measures are related to the three point correlation function. So once we are able to calculate the curvature perturbation, we can, there are standard ways uh, to do that. I am not going to get into the details. It's a bit, um, lengthy computation, but quite standard recipes. But, so we just Sorry, I, I have a, again, knife question. So the source term, mm -hmm. you have written it uh, E dot B, which is more of the standard thing. And then uh, kind of Fourier, uh, right? Right, right, yeah. Uh, with, with, with this prefactor. So now this K is uh, your uh, momentum, if I am right. Sorry, and which one? K, so this, K is the bold K. Yes, bold yes. is the uh, and X yes. is the special. But now you are in. So the whole thing is happening in Robertson Walker space time, right? Yeah, we are assuming a de sitter space time. Yes. Okay, the de sitter. But so in de sitter, yes. you don't have a K dot X right. structure because right. it's just a manifold. So uh, what's I mean because K dot X is can you not cannot define K dot X in a manifold. So how uh, how did you proceed or what, like what is actually going here? Or do you have just taking a chart and then you are doing everything chart wise? So is my um, question clear to you? Like what's I'm thinking? Uh, it's it's, it looks like it's like okay, so maybe I can rephrase. So like uh, your K is a momentum and X is a point in your de sitter space time, right? Yes, so X yes. is a point in your manifold. Right, and you right. can't take a scalar product uh, on, on, with a point of your manifold because your manifold don't has a strict scalar product structure. It's just a manifold. So what if we take like a hypersurface in the manifold? Okay, then which hypersurface you're taking? And hypersurface is also a manifold. So even in hypersurface, it's a Riemannian manifold if you take a hyper space like hypersurface, and that's also a manifold. So in a Riemannian manifold, so it means like k dot x means you are taking with respect to Riemannian matrix, something like that. Uh, I don't think so. Okay, so maybe Rahat, just... can I say something? Yes, please. So I think what Rahat is doing here is that, so if you take the de Sitter space, and then uh, there are of course very different foliations of the de Sitter space, uh, but the foliation of the de Sitter space that we are interested in here is the one where the sections are flat sections. The three, three hypersurfaces are, because that's basically uh, what is going to be representing a, uh, uh, you know, a universe on a large scale that is going to be our universe. The spatial sections are assumed to be flat, uh, you know, and so the dot product here is just the dot product on three-dimensional Euclidean space. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have to think a bit more. I didn't encounter this question before. <laughs>
Yeah, sorry, just some formal. No, no, thank you. Thank you Please so much. On. Maybe I will talk again after the talk. Thanks. I think okay. these are mathematicians' questions, Rahat. You're not gonna. Yeah, so, so <laughs> don't worry about <laughs> it. I don't know this <laughs> stuff, so I'm setting. asking this. Yeah, yeah. No, Please it's good on. to know. Good to know. Thank you. Yeah, thank yeah, you no, I know. I think they're good questions. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, now, if we look at the uh, tensor perturbations, as Jawad was asking before, so by the tensor perturbations are basically you look at the uh, the fluctuations here. So in the so you you naively have like you don't discriminate between the dx square, dy square, dz square, but if you look at the transverse stressless part of the metric and uh, uh, of, of the tensor, you have fluctuations here. And then similarly, you can, from the Einstein equation, you can calculate the equation of motion and you encounter the same thing. You have a source term Tij, which depends on the gauge fields, which you would not have if you had the, uh, did not have the gauge fields present. So essentially what you have is just this equation equal to zero just for the inflaton. But now because of the presence of gauge fields, this would be modified and we can follow the same recipe. We can calculate the source term because of this and we can use the Green's function formalism to see the impact of this source term on the tensor perturbation. Once we have the tensor perturbation, we can calculate the two point correlation and three point correlation functions which would tell us what, how much power spectrum we have and how much non gaussianity we have from the tensor perturbations. So we want to specifically look at these because we want to calculate gravitational wave signatures. So we will calculate this uh, tensor perturbation and then calculate the two point yeah. correlation function and it would give us um, gravitational wave amplitudes. Sorry, is there a question? Yeah, so why you said that this tensor perturbation will give me uh, the amount of non Gaussian non Gaussian in the same amic. Why it introduced non Gaussian? Um, so typically, inflationary perturbations are Gaussian. So if you are by Gaussian, you mean the that. Edges, right. Sorry. Right. Yeah. Please continue. Oh yeah. So if it is Gaussian, then you only have to look up to two point correlation functions because any higher point correlation function would be zero. Would they would vanish? Now, if you have extra things present, things may change. And we will see that uh, for specifically if the gauge fields are coupled to inflaton, then the signal can become non-Gaussian. And if it is non-Gaussian, then you have to look at higher point correlation functions like three point and even continue to do for four point, et cetera. And there is a way to measure the non-Gaussianity. I mean, there is a parameter that measures the amount of non-Gaussianity present. And at CMB scale, we know what the constraints are on the parameter. So we can see so the prediction. I, I get of this your model. point. What I'm not understanding is that uh, you, you are saying this this um, this tensor perturbation is catching uh, the non Gaussian key, right? No, no. I'm I mean, saying I the must... tensor perturbation. I mean, you have to calculate the three point correlation function for the tensor perturbation, and then see if it is non zero. If it is non zero, then that tells you that it is non Gaussian. Yeah, I I think I didn't quite get this point. Uh, uh, could you rephrase the question, please? Um, okay, I, I get I, I get your point that why I need to calculate three point function as you said. Uh, two point function will give full Gaussianity and uh, two point function and to calculate to, to know that there was like more massive gauge boson, you need to calculate three point function. Or oh, no. what I'm if not is... getting is that why? Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 please. No, if you if your perturbation is Gaussian, then you can mm -hmm. show from calculation that a three point correlation function and any higher point correlation function would be identical to zero. Right, and maybe any odd power correlation function is zero. Y yes. If if it is Ga Gaussian. Basically. If it is Gaussian, so right. if you have non-zero three point correlation function, then that tells mm -hmm. you that it's non-Gaussian. Now right. we know that from just from the uh, inflaton perturbations. Observationally, the, right. only the inflaton perturbations are Gaussian, and the standard inflationary theory gives you uh, the inflaton perturbation, which you can use to calculate that the three-point correlation function vanishes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But now, if you have extra things present, it may change. I'm not saying uh, that it necessarily has to change, but it may change. So we can calculate it and see if it is non-zero. If it is non-zero, then we have some constraints from CMB physics, not not extremely constraining, but we have some constraints sure. from CMB physics. Okay, well, How much non-gaussianity has been ruled out? Mm 
So we can use that as a constraint on the model and see what parameter space is okay. So I'm, I'm talking about all of these because before claiming that we have detectable gravitational wave signals mm -hmm. from some parameter space, I want to make sure that this parameter space is okay with all the constraints we know about currently from CMB physics. Right. So I will try to constrain the model from CMB physics. And then in the remaining kind of allowed parameter space, I will show that you can still have detectable gravitational wave signals. Thank you. Sure. So uh, as I was mentioning before, so the, th the three uh, quantities that I will focus on here from CMB physics, the first one is the scalar power spectrum. And scalar power has two parts. The first part in blue, this is the contribution from the inflaton itself. If you did not have any gauge fields, only the vacuum modes, then you have this part. And the second part is proportional to the two-point correlation function of the gauge bosons. Oh, sorry, uh, two-point correlation function of the curvature perturbation. And this part would have contribution yeah. from the uh, presence of gauge fields. So the combined effect is that you have to add them. And what we observationally know is the sum of these two things has to be this number, 2.5 times 10 to the power minus nine. Now, there is a subtlety here. We, as I mentioned, we don't exactly know what what is Hubble scale or what is phi dot during inflation or at the end of inflation. So this quantity h over phi dot is actually not known. And the red term here, uh, the contribution of the gauge field, that actually comes as higher powers of this h over phi dot uh, to the power four, and uh, you can go on. So how do we use the constraint here? We cannot because uh, the, this is unknown, and we also have model two two model parameters which are unknown. So what we do is we assume that, or we are interested in the scenario where the contribution from the gauge, uh, from this uh, gauge field would be negligible compared to the vacuum contribution. Now, why do we make this choice? Uh, one motivation could be to make sure that things are perturbative. For example, why don't you continue to add more higher loop corrections to this? So because if this is negligible, then we can say that, okay, we, I can only calculate one loop. I don't have to go further because those would be more and more suppressed. And the other reason is actually, it makes the computation easier because if we are restricted to the regime where this term can be neglected, then the only the first term has to be equated to this number. So that tells us what h over phi dot should be and once I know that, then I can also calculate the second term because it just comes as higher order powers of h over phi dot. So for these two reasons, I will concentrate on the regime where at CMB, the contribution of the gauge field would be negligible compared to the vacuum contribution. Now that would also mean that uh, I have to make sure that I am only constrained to the parameter space where the second term does not become too large. The second um, constraint is non-Gaussianity. So yeah, yeah. Um, so so um, uh, one of the is like so dimensionality. Dimension, if you think that the one over delta has has this dimension of like volume, right? So I, I'm like, uh, what is the what are the volume we're kind of thinking? Uh, I'm like, is it uh, like the volume now or like the volume at the? Uh, I'm, I mean, like, does it make sense? Like, uh, uh, make... Well, for me, this, this delta function simply means that you have two external momenta because it's a two-point correlation function. So you have two mm -hmm. external lines of uh, inflaton perturbations. Right, and right. then you have a loop of gauge bosons. And this delta function only means that in three-dimensional space, the minus space yes, they should sum right. up to zero, as we can expect from any frame. Yeah, but it counts as like one over delta. So... Oh, oh, I mean, I mean, right. it's uh, one over because when we calculate the two point correlation function, the curly brackets here, that actually has the delta function, like proportional to the delta function. Because when you calculate the two point correlation function, you are essentially calculating a Feynman diagram, one to Feynman diagram. Right, right, right. right, right. So I want to function. nullify that to, to cancel that out I'm dividing by the delta function because the power spectrum does not have any delta function. It does not care about, right. I mean, how, how many extra right. Right. Yeah. Okay. okay, now the second parameter that I'm concerned about is non-Gaussianity. Now at CMB scale, um, 
I mean, in for calculating non-Gaussianity, you need to take some sort of ratio of the three-point correlation function to the two-point correlation function. And in three-point correlation function, you have three external legs. So typically people take certain interesting uh, configurations and calculate those um, interesting, I mean, calculate the non-Gaussianity at those interesting configurations. So one of the popular ones is called equilateral configuration, where basically the three momenta are exactly same in magnitude. And the CMB data analysis gives us good constraint on this uh, configuration. So if I do that, the equilateral configuration, then CMB tells us that from Planck 2018 data, this number is an order 10 number. And specifically it's restricted to this minus 25 plus minus 47. As you can see that then it can become it can be positive or negative. Uh, roughly, it would mean that if you have a perfectly Gaussian shape, then you could have a non-Gaussian shape, which is like a slightly deviated to the right or slightly deviated to the left. Then a positive FNL, if the positive FNL corresponds to a slightly deviated to the right configuration, then the minus would correspond to slightly deviated to the left. So that's okay, that is, that's not really a big problem, but th that would be another constraint that we can use. So as you can see here, this is basically the ratio of the three point correlation function. Again, I have, I'm dividing by the Delta function K1, K2 plus K3, just to get rid of the Delta function, which is inside this three point correlation function. So basically it cancels that out. And we take the ratio of that with the square of the power spectrum, uh, just to make sure that this FNL is a dimensionless number. That's actually one of the reasons why this three-point correlation function is also called a bias spectrum because it's like the square comparable to the square of the power spectrum. So that would be the second constraint on my model parameter space. And finally, we have the tensor to scalar ratio, which is the ratio of the tensor power to scalar power. And at CMB scales, this is constrained to be at least order, I mean, at least order to uh, suppress 0.056. So these are the three constraints that I want to impose to make sure that I have allowed parameter space, which is consistent with this. And um, yeah. Um, so yes. in, in the last slide, in the previous slide, you said that it is constrained at R less than 0 0.056. So I mean, what do you mean by that? I mean, like, no matter how much loop you include, it these R won't uh, surpass that. Is it what you mean? Like, no matter right, exactly. how many fields you add, uh, that, that's exactly. the experimental constraint that we are giving. We, we right. Have. So, okay. right. So you're right. So basically, um, your tensor power would have a contribution from the gauge bosons, and that would be exponentially dependent on the chemical potential parameter psi and also on the mass of the gauge field. So by varying the chemical potential mass, suppose I treat them as free parameters and I make them sufficiently large or small so that I can make their contribution larger and larger. Now, how far can I go? So this constant tells us that no matter what I do, I cannot exceed this bound. My tensor power should not be uh, larger than the scalar power, at least by two orders of magnitude. It has to be suppressed at least by two orders of magnitude. So in a sense, then you can use this as a constant on any parameter space, how much your chemical potential be, I mean, how large can your chemical potential be, or how small can your mass be, et cetera. So these are the constraints from CMB physics. And now there's another thing to worry about if you want to go beyond CMB physics. Now it is important for us to go beyond CMB physics because as I mentioned that at CMB physics, uh, the gravitational wave signal is very suppressed. So we are hoping that maybe at later stages, the signal would grow up. We are hoping because we have seen that our mode function exponentially increases with inflatons velocity. And closer to the end of inflation, the inflatons velocity increases. So we are hoping to have a larger signal. But that also means that the simplistic assumptions we made before that we would ignore these terms completely at the CMB scale, we can no longer do that if we go beyond CMB scale. So when you go beyond CMB scale, we have the gauge bosons inverse decay into the uh, inflaton and that can change things. And we should consistently take those into account. So what it means is we have to solve these two coupled equations, coupled because as you can see, in order to know H, I have to know phi dot, but in order to solve for phi dot, I need to know H in the presence of these gauge contributions. Now, in order to do that, I also have to specify what V is. V is the inflaton potential. 
So I can no longer do this model independently. I have to assume a model for the inferton, inferton potential. So that is what we want to do next by for going to uh, next level. Uh, I think I have already talked about this. That I, yeah, basically this slide tells that I wanted to ignore these terms at the same list. I think I've already talked about this. So this is the constant plot I want to show. Um, the three constants I talked about that the scalar power has to be negligible coming from the gauge bosons that gives us this constant, this dashed line here. And then tensor to scalar ratio gives us this constraint. So we can see that this is more constraining, but the but the most constraining is basically the non-Gaussian unity parameter. Non-Gaussian unity parameter rules out a large portion of the parameter space. You might be wondering why I have this cusp kind of shape here. It's because um, this constraint comes from positive FNL and this constraint comes from negative FNL, which means that there might be some narrow strip here where the signal is actually Gaussian. But that also falls into the regime where I am violating other things. So I am not trying to pursue that. Then I would be left with only this white region, which would be allowed, which would be consistent to the three constraints I talk about. So if we want to find gravitational wave signals, it has to come from this region. Now, why that is challenging? It's challenging because as you can see, this plot has been drawn for mass versus chemical potential minus mass. It means that let's say if my mass is two Hubble, then my chemical potential can only be like little more than three Hubble, not much more than that. And I know that my signal is exponentially enhanced to the chemical potential. So this is telling me that I cannot really make my chemical potential arbitrarily large. The, I can only go so much and then it makes it challenging. Will my gravitational wave signals be enhanced enough so that I, it could be sensitive to the interferometers? So let's take a look. So as I mentioned at beyond CMB level, we have to specify a particular potential for the inferton. And we chose a model called the Starminsky model. The Starminsky model has a shape of the potential like this, uh, where the inferton is exponential. It depends on exponential on the inferton field and then is squared on that. So why we choose this potential is because there are constraints on what kind of in inflationary potentials we could have, what kind of potentials we can have on the inflaton from a famous plot called the NS versus R plot. Maybe I should show the plot here, yeah. So this NS is the spectral index, which is close to one, but not exactly one. I think the current constraint is 0 0.96, uh, close to 0 0.96. And R is the tensor to scalar ratio, as I mentioned before. So this plot has been used to basically rule out what kind of inflationary models we can or cannot have. So for example, some uh, early models consider uh, that the inferton potential is like phi square or phi four because those are simpler shapes, but the current data excludes all of those. The model that I want to consider is this green strip here, uh, which in Planck 2008 data is called an R square inflation, uh, but it's also called Starminsky model by some people. So this model, as you can see, is in the sweet spot of this plot. So this blue region is what is allowed right now. And this plot is kind of in the middle of that. So I can, I would say that this is a comparatively safe model with respect to data. And this would probably give us a more realistic scenario of what kind of signals would be possible. So that's why we choose this star the model. Now, once we have chosen this model V, then basically we have everything we need in order to solve these two equations as a coupled system of equations. And once we do that, then we will know how phi, the inflaton field evolves as a function of time. We will know how Hubble rate changes as a function of time. Of course, we know that during inflation, the Hubble rate doesn't change much, but even the tiny amount of changes, we want to take that into account. And the change of the inflaton field is important because our one of the parameters of interest, chemical potential is dependent on the time derivative of phi. So if I know how phi changes with time, I can translate that into how phi dot changes with time. And that would tell us how my model parameter, chemical potential changes with time. Okay. So once we do that consistently, then basically we know, uh, here I'm showing an example, how the chemical potential and the uh, mass over H changes. So of course the mass doesn't change, but Hubble rate falls off a bit, it remains in the same order of magnitude, but falls off a bit. 
So that's why MA over H would also increase a bit. Here, the x-axis is n. n is some sort of measure of time. This is called an e-folding number. Roughly, you start off at n equals to 60 at CMB scale. Then as you get closer to the inflation, end of inflation, it decreases. And depending on convention, uh, n becomes zero by the end of inflation or close to zero. Now, for me, I would take the convention that I say inflation has is over when the slow roll parameter is order one. That would imply that n is not quite zero at the end of inflation, but it would be uh, probably like five or six, depending on the parameter we're talking about. So here we see that initially, as expected, the chemical potential is increasing quite rapidly. This region is in the early stages of inflation, but soon after you can see that the growth has decreased. This is because now the energy density of the gauge field is becoming important. So they will start to impact on the equation of motion of the inflaton. And that acts like a friction term for the equation of motion of the inflaton. So the inflaton's rolling is slowed down and this parameter xi is nothing but proportional to phi dot. So that this, this is reflected here that its growth is slowed down until the end of the close to the end of inflation where again, it kind of rapidly rises. So that's because you, the friction term becomes so important that you are kind of back to the slow roll regime. Then it's just like what was initially here. Then you again start to go up. I mean, of course, if I could show further into the preheating period, you could see this pattern repeating again and again. And some people have actually studied the preheating period, what happens during that time. And they have showed that this can actually become oscillatory at the later stages. But anyway, I will only concentrate up to the end of inflation. So for me, the effect is that uh, the growth of the chemical potential is slowed down until the close to the end of inflation where it starts to rise again. And similarly for the mass over H parameter. So with this understanding now, basically earlier we looked at N equals to 60 at CMB scale. Now at the later stages, uh, we can look at signals which would be sensitive to the interferometers. And that's what we want to do now. So this is the kind of the same plot I showed before. I showed you the blue line before. This is one of the benchmark points, which I think is an interesting point because this gives a signal here in the nano harsh region. So roughly, I should probably give some more uh, in description here. Uh, roughly, there are three frequency bands that gravitational wave interferometers are probing now. One is the nano harsh regime. By, I mean, not exactly nanohertz, like 10 to the power minus seven to 10 to the power minus 10 in this regime. Here, the currently operational uh, experiments are EPTA and nanograph, and the planned experiments are IPTA and SCA. So these uh, PTAs are pulsar timing errors. They're basically many, many pulsar timing um, interfer little interferometers that are combined together to analyze the data. So this signal would be sensitive to this frequency regime. And then in the next band, um, close to the millihertz band, here we have LISA, which is uh, going to be operational possibly from 2035-ish. Mm -hmm. And it's a very, um, its physics scope is quite large. It can detect many different kinds of signals. And as you can see, all of these signals would be within the sensitivity of LISA. So uh, we expect some detection there. We also have other, um, experiments roughly in the same range, Desigo and BBO, which would be operational much later, at least 10 years later than LISA. Then in the Hertz regime or 10 Hertz regime, we currently have operational is LIGO. The gray region is what LIGO has already excluded, but there are planned upgrades of LIGO, uh, high luminosity LIGO and LIGO and Virgo together, etc. So those would be sensitive to slightly weaker gravitational waves. And as you can see that uh, many of the signals I'm showing here will be sensitive to that regime. And in the same band, we have this Einstein telescope planned, which would be much more sensitive compared to what LIGO would ever go. Now, in these major three bands, we see that the, our signal would be sensitive to all these three. Now, people who are not familiar with gravitational waves uh, signals, I should mention that this is a very exciting thing because typically, most of the stochastic sources of gravitational wave would give you signals which are localized in frequency band. For example, one common source of uh, stochastic gravitational waves is from first order phase transitions. Um, those signals are kind of peaked at a certain frequency. And 
from domain was those are also peaked at a certain frequency. So most of the signals are kind of peaked at one frequency or like they're confined to a narrow frequency band, which is why they're difficult to probe. Or even if you probe them, it's difficult to know whether this is from some sort of noise or it's from the signal. But if you have a signal, which can be detected in different experiments operating at completely different um, frequency bands. And also some of them are in space like LIGO, some of them are in terrestrial like LIGO, and some are in space like uh, LISA. So they have completely different kinds of systematics and uh, uh, background errors. If you detect signals at multiple interferometers, it's much more likely that this is an actual signal and not noise. And this model gives you that kind of signal, which is very interesting, I think. And the other thing interesting is that the shape of the signal is kind of as if it was like designed for the sensitivity of these interferometers, because as you can see, the most sensitive signals should be at the PTA. And then as you go on to LISA and LIGO, you have less and less sensitivity. And the shape of the signal is exactly like that. It kind of grows as you go along the frequency bands. So I think this would be a promising way to look at the presence of uh, massive gauge bosons uh, during inflation. And it would be complementary to the oscillatory shape that uh, Malasen and Nima proposed to look at. Also experimentally, I think it's more likely that these gravitational wave signals should be seen earlier than what, I mean, compared to looking at oscillatory signals at CMB scale experiment-wise. So that's another reason I think that this could be an interesting way to look at new physics during inflation. So to sum up, I proposed that uh, gravitational wave signals could be a complementary signal for cosmological collider physics, which is essentially the program of looking at if we have new particles present during inflation and if we can detect them. And I considered a simple model and found the most up to date constraint on this model from CMB skills. And I showed that there is a characteristic gravitational wave signal, which just evades the CMB upper bound, but becomes visible in the interferometer skills in many different ranges of frequencies. And for future direction, this model is also interesting in other ways. Uh, so another characteristic of this model is that it leads to parity violation because the term phi FF tilde, this term CMOS term inherently violates parity. There are two ways of looking at parity violation. One is the gravitational wave signal is uh, chiral, which I did not get into discussion much because I think, uh, I mean, what I've shown here, uh, this kind of parity violation probably would not be detectable at LISA or LIGO skills unless some new technology arrives. But we could also look for parity violation from four point correlation function of the curvature perturbations. And recently, there has been a hint of this observation from large scale structure service, Galaxy Data. So we hope that this model can also explain that kind of parity violation from four point correlation function. And that's something that I'm working on right now if we can explain the recently observed uh, pair devaluation in galaxy survey data. So that would be all. If you have more questions, I'd be happy to discuss. Thank you very much, Rahat, for the beautiful Thank talk. You. And we are happy to receive questions. Yes, please, Dawad, you can unmute yourself. Oh, sorry, is Doi Payon? No, I was unmuted. Yeah, so if you any of you have any question, just unmute yourself and uh, ask this your question. So if not, then uh, I may ask uh, again some nice questions. So you have uh, demonstrated very beautifully that uh, using uh, this sort of model you are working, one can uh, talk about whether there exists in flattened field and if exists some of the signature. So, and also then you mentioned this parity violation. So there might be other sort of symmetry, uh, some modeling for our universe models. So is it expected that this model or some other model of this derivative can shed some light about some other uh, sort of symmetry or breaking up those symmetry? Uh, I, to my knowledge, no, to my knowledge, uh, we can have parity violation signals from here. I do not know if any of the fundamental symmetry breaking could be seen 
I think not because if we look at the term phi ff tilde, so that violates parity, but it doesn't violate the other symmetries. So I don't think so. I see. Okay. And then uh, another question. I mean, uh, if if uh, we say, for instance, the Lagrangian you have showed, uh, uh, so if we add some uh, term which is related to space time curvature or uh, space time geometry, and then carry on provided it is possible the analysis you have done uh, yeah. then uh, can you sh uh, see or expect to see some sort of uh, effect of space time curvature from this sort of analysis like density yeah actually there are some models uh, maybe so instead of sorry instead of this phi ff mm -hmm. tilde there are models like uh, rr tilde where r exactly. is the Exactly, yeah, the Ricci scalar, like Ricci curvature, and then you you can uh, do this sort of thing, and then see some like like uh, restrict something that can be uh, ruled out from CMB data or or this sort of uh, inferometry data. Is it possible using those? Models? I think so. I think people have looked at, um, for example, from CMB physics how you can constrain. But my understanding is that that kind of models do not give you large gravitational wave signals. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. but they are yeah kind of I mean, quite restricted from CMB physics. However, they so, can uh, give can, you a possible. Uh, can I? Yeah, please. Uh, but in in a sense, uh, it's not R tilde R, but it's uh, it's you know the Starobinsky inflation that you were talking about. That's a higher curvature model, right? Because it's uh, it's is the simplest case of the FR models, right? So mm -hmm. uh, uh, so yes, I mean I think. Uh, yeah, it's not the R tilde R model that uh, you uh, oh. that would be perfectly analogous to this F tilde F model, but you know the Starobinsky model is kind of where you actually have higher an R squared term, right? I so, think so. Yes, higher R squared. Yeah. Do you think that that kind of model should also have large signals? Well, I mean, I'm not a cosmology cosmologist, but I'm just like saying that. Uh -huh. uh, what uh, you know, Onirban was saying is that yes, that is actually uh, also being um, treated in the guise of the Starobinsky model, which of course right, then right. gives rise to some new, uh, different potential, right? It's, mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, are there any further questions? Um, is there going to be a short discussion afterward or not? Yeah, I can. Yeah, yeah. We, we, sure. we are open like half an hour more. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, provided, Rahat, you have time. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. I mean, I have uh, some waiting. basic questions. So, I, I was I, mean, I was looking forward to asking that in the afterward discussion. Uh, okay. So, if there is no other question, we thank again to the speaker. Uh, maybe a virtual clap or. <laughs> Uh, maybe a reaction. <laughs> it's my pleasure to have the opportunity to speak. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, excellent talk. That's really nice. Yeah, thank nice you. Sport. Thank you.